School of Arts in Scotland uh, now. Um, what I want to talk about today is this. It's my graduation project, which um, was called Sensible Sense, designing for perceptive qualities and artificial tactile sense for upper extremity amputees. Uh, but people will probably just say it's a robot arm. Um, so that's the reason um, why I'm here. Um, during my graduation, um, what we did was also, we were always looking at the interaction between people and, and products. Um, and this, this prosthesis arm, as I will explain later on, is a perfect example of, of integrating the two in a very intimate way. Uh, so today I also want to focus on the human experiences that robots can actually bring us. So, starting with a few examples of what robots could be. This is the first thing I thought about. Um, thinking about robots, maybe Hopefully we'll get there at some point in our life, because it would be pretty cool. Um, fortunately, it's still assembling itself now. But this is also, I think, one of the uh, big robot systems that everybody will know, the assembly line robots. Uh, Asimo, um, I think most of you might have seen him before as well. Been developing, one has been developing it for a long time. It still works pretty funny. Um, but it's how people engage with it, especially children, is this really interesting to see, I think. And this is also a, a nice one. Um, it's from an artist called Ajiri. Yes, it's called the Wachtas. Um, it's made a few, four of them are in, in the, on the bridge in Vando. It's not a robot, of course. Um, I'll probably not even be allowed to relate it to robots, but I think if you show it to, to little kids, they still, still see a robot in it. So, kind of raise the question of what is a robot? Does it have to move? Does it have to talk? Or is it just the expression like this and like the transformer one? Um, the vacuum cleaner robot, everybody will know it, probably one of the most boring robots around. <laughs> Except for this guy, it must be a pretty boring <laughs> robot sometimes. Um, right, so a few examples. Um, but the interesting thing, I think for robots is the interaction, when you get to the point where you can interact with them without thinking about it, without programming them in, in a certain way or giving them commands and having them execute, we actually get into a conversation with the robots and get into a, an, an engagement on a human level. Um, so I want to show you I have a few little videos in this presentation. Um, let me see if I can... Yeah. That's a few minutes I'll just talk about what you see. This is the two companies. The first one is Festo. They're developing robots like this. Um, it's, it's, of course, very fluent movement, very beautiful thing in itself. Uh, but Festo is not, they don't sell these robots, they do these projects to, to explore how, um, how the dynamics work, um, how they actually sell fel felps, I think, and assembly line robots, and they use these kind of projects to explore the principles behind it, how things move, how things yeah, how, how they. This one is it's a very small. Uh, Alibella, I don't know what the English word, dragonfly. It's actually as big, I think, as a real one. But you get all this technology in this very tiny space. It made a bird which is able to fly. All, all of the things fly autonomous, by the way, they're not being controlled. Um, 
that they use these, these known principles. Everybody sees what it is, and they create these beautiful things uh, of it. Um, elephant's trunk. And this can actually be on the assembly line, picking things from one belt, placing it on the other. This is uh, the idea behind it, and how they then translate it into something that's there, that's moving. Um, and this is a really cool one, because what you can see now, if they put pressure on this, this, this um, thing they make, the cylinder, and the ends contract. And that's actually exactly how human muscle works. So what they did is they made a human uh, part of the body, not to replace a human body part, but just to explore how you can use all of these cylinders in a, in a combined way to create this movement in it, and the same, as, yeah, the same movement as a human movement. The other company I want to show is Boston Dynamics. Um, and the nice thing about this, that's completely different from what you've just seen with the vessel, which is very fluent, very beautiful, very poetic. And this is just, if you heard the sound, they were, that's a cross, um, cross mower motor, I think, that they started. Yeah. Um, so they, it was actually in the news this morning, I an article on Newfoundland and Al, which said that one of the robots they're working on, um, they got up to recognize objects and be able to jump over it. It can run at about 50 kilometers an hour and jump over objects once they encounter it. But none of this is part of all programmed, of course, but it's, it's just, um, recognizing the environment and, and acting in that environment. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sounds impressive, but that's okay. It's really cool because it looks like there's two people crowding <laughs> in and walking in. Uh, they're funded by business. No, I want to see why. So you see that they program these basic principles, of course, but then the robot acts out of itself and its own behavior. And if it tends to fall over or correct itself, um, <laughs> so it's very recognizable how it behaves and how it um, responds, and, and you probably all see the, the animals that they intended to make in it. Um, it's a thing called zoomorphism, where they, where they get um, animal expressions and non-animal things, which all of this, I mean, everybody saw a, a dog in it. All those things. The other thing um, that, that tends to happen with the robots is anthropomorphism. Well, not only with robots, anthropomorphism is um, to express human qualities and characteristics and non human things. So, gods, for example, um, they are represented as humans, or they are humans. Um, fable characters, uh, cartoons, all of this, they all have human um, expressions and, and human skills, but are not human. Even buildings where you see a face in it and so anthropomorphism is, is a term out there to well to, to capture that part. Um that what's going to happen with robots. Um it's called the, the it's about the uncanny valley here. Um and if you look at it it's the human likeliness and the familiarity familiarity how we feel with it. Industrial robots very low level and here is a healthy person and, and of course this is the interesting part because Basically, it tells you that the more real it becomes, um, it's all okay and it's all really nice, but at some point it becomes a bit eerie, a bit strange. And, and prosthetic, I didn't make this by the way, but the prosthetic hand is always the perfect example to say, that, to show what this actually means. Because um, well, the other things with, a, with AI and with, with the, the, the graphics, I've been struggling a long time. Because if you try to make a human, you have to make it a perfect human for people to. Accepted as a human. This is really creepy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, prosthesis, so we're getting back to prosthesis now a little bit. Um, they've been an example for it also for a long time. The, the first one is basically it's just an insult to ask people to wear it like this because it doesn't look like a hand, it just looks like something ridiculous. But artists now make these really lifelike human um, gloves to get over the prosthesis. Um, but you cannot imagine that if you Encounter a person with this, this prosthesis, um, you'll probably not come up to you and say, Hey, by the way, I miss my arm and, and this is not real. But you start talking with them, and at some point, maybe you see the hand moving in a very stiff way, or you, you give them a hand, and as soon as you see it not moving the way you expect it to move, or you touch it and you feel that it's not real, it's very 
strange, and that's what this uncanny valley represents. That as soon as you get to something pretending to be human, you have to do it perfect, or it can become very, very yeah, creepy. Um, this is a part of an essay written by Kuk van Mantel, one of the, the teachers at the Eindhoven University of Technology, and he talks about anthropomorphia. So we've just saw the anthropomorphism, which is just expressing human characteristics and human things. Which Uncanny Valley talks about the uh, anthropomorphia that, um, well, anthropomorphia is a fear of recognizing human characteristics in non-human objects. Uh, the blurring boundary between people and products is leading to increased problems. Complaint can be Things can be accompanied by irrational panic attacks, disdain, revulsion, and confusion what it means to be human. Um, he talks about it in this essay, not as a thing already there, but he tries to, to explore it, because the boundary between people and products are, is, is blurring. Uh, as these become very real, the people also become, I wouldn't want to say become products, but think about the Google Glass, for example, where you know there's something going on somewhere People are influenced by, by products without you knowing how they're influenced. And this anthropomorphia then tries to, to yeah, dig into that a little bit to explore it, how it can change the relationship between people because there are products um, in between. But he also says that anthropomorphia is a completely human centered term. Um, it is people who determine what makes them uncomfortable and what doesn't. Uh, anthropomorphia is therefore dynamic and enduring term that can change with time and with us, for we will change that much is certain. And this is an important one to keep in mind. Um, well, you can probably already see it happening a lot in, in, in the past, where when airplanes were invented, if you think about the first airplane landing in, in Africa somewhere, people who hadn't known about planes before, this huge thing coming out of the sky, people walking out of it. I wouldn't be surprised if they see these people as different people from themselves because of this Logical thing that's been in between. Um, that it's not a human characteristic in this airplane, but it's how technology gets in this relation between people. And this guy is the perfect example um, of, of, well, like who, who said um, that it's a human centered term, and it's, it's us that who determine what makes us uncomfortable and that we can change. and. This is the perfect example to show how our senses um, can change and can um, adapt to the technology and, and use it in a completely new way. Um, it's just a two minute video. Some of you might have seen it before. But, um. Well, I was born with a, with a rare visual condition called achromatopsia, which is total color blindness. So I've never seen color and I don't know what color looks like because I come from a grayscale world. To me, the, the sky is always gray, flowers are always gray, and television is still in black and white. But since the age of 21, instead of seeing color, I can hear color. Uh, in 2003, I started a project with computer scientist Adam Montandon, and the result, with further collaborations with Peter Keshe from Slovenia and Matthias Lizana from Barcelona is this uh, electronic eye. It's a color sensor that detects the color frequency in front of me and sends this frequency to a chip installed at the back of my head and I hear the color in front of me through the bone, through bone conduction. So for example, if I have, if I have like... This is the sound of purple. For example, this is the sound of grass. This is red, like dead. This is the sound of a dirty sock, like, which is like yellow, this one. So I've been hearing color all the time for eight years, since 2004. So I find it completely normal now to hear color all the time. Um, at start, though, I had to memorize the the names you give for each color, so I had to memorize the notes, but after some time all this information became a perception. I didn't have to think about the notes, and after some time this perception became a feeling. I started to have favorite colors and I started to dream in color. So uh, when I started to dream in color is when I felt 
that the software and my brain had united. Because in my dreams, it was my brain creating electronic sounds. It wasn't the software. So that's when I started to feel like a cyborg. It's when I started to feel that the cybernetic device was no longer a device. It, it had become a part of my body, an extension of my senses. And after some time, it even became a part of my official image. After this, he showed a photo of his passport, which was a big deal to get a passport photo with this thing in his head, because you're not even allowed to wear a cap or, or glasses are allowed, but it's been a big problem for him. And when he got to the point where it was accepted, because he could, well, he could show that it was a part of him. And the interesting thing, the interesting thing about it is, of course, that these are the kind of sensors that are used in robots to recognize a human environment around us. Um, but it's not just robots that can take benefit from it, because, well, as he explains, it becomes part of his system as well. It's not just a thing on his head that, that's, well, that, that's there. It's actually integrated with this sense that he already has, and he experienced a whole new layer through this, this, well, this device. In the back is a painting that he made. Um, so what it does now is that uh, he paints, for example, Mozart, uh, made a Lady Gaga painting. They also painted the speeches from um, from Nelson. No. Uh, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> and Adolf Hitler. And it's interesting to see that the speech from Adolf Hitler was uh, a lot more colorful because it talks a lot. Martin Luther King, of course, very low voice and subtle. If he moves in front of it, he can recognize these these sounds. Um, so it's it's a completely different level of, of expression and, and well, perception as well. Um, right. So I want to the last step and wanted to talk about some basic principles of interaction with technology because what he's doing is a perfect example of it. I'm going to talk about prestige in a little bit, um, but these are the principles that, that lie at the bottom when you're talking about interaction humans and products. So Martin Heidegg has been a famous philosopher um, and I just briefly want to mention it, I'm not going to go too deep in it because I'm not a philosopher and other people probably know a lot more about it than I. But he talks about um, Vorhanden and Zuhanden and ready at hand is Vorhanden, uh, Zuhanden I mean. It's the example of the hammer, it's always been used. If you use a hammer you're not focused on the hammer and how you move the hammer, you focus on the nail which you're going to hit in the wall. So you use this hammer as an extension your body so people are able to, to use tools as an extension of your own body. Um, David Abraham talks about the act of perception as an animate play between perceiver and perceived world in which neither is passive and basically it means that, that anything you can interact with, the interaction is not inherent in either the product or yourself. I might interact different with things than, than you will or you will. Um, and it's, the interaction is happening between the two people or person and product who are interacting. Come back to that in a little bit with the prosthesis. And the last one is uh, Sidney Fels, who talks about four different intimate relationships people can have with technologies. First one, for example, if, if you can imagine if, you're, if your grandma would use a computer for the first time, start typing the keyboard, will give a sense of satisfaction and, and happiness maybe to see the letters actually appear on the screen, that you do something and you see the result is what you intended it to do. Um, but another one, which is maybe more interesting, is that the result, the result is not the most important thing, it's actually the doing this that gives you the, the, the joy in doing it. And musicians, for example, it's the joy of, of using something to express yourself. Um, that it are the aesthetics that, that he's talking about, so it's just not just getting to a result, but actually using a product that can also well, give you the joy um, with it. Right, so a short overview until now, look at some examples for robots, um, some basic experience of robot qualities, what we can see in it, the relation between robots and human qualities, um, and a great example, I think, of, of how these qualities are integrated, and some very short principles of the uh, philosophy of the experience of interaction. Um, so we try to break it down a little bit going from robots to what are actually the human experiences that robots can bring us. Now I'm going to try to build it back up with the prosthesis 
project um, that we did, and, and hopefully it, it will make sense. At this point, I also want to introduce you to John. This is John, and I work with him um, on another project that is what we were developing in Flagging Prestigious. Um, but when I met him, he just lost his arm a year ago, or two years ago. Um, but he's a great guy to work with. Of course, I can't make a prestigious for myself because you can never experience it in the same way. So you need to do it together with somebody. And John is really the best guy you can have with it because he was really open to talk about anything, to test anything, to, to or you just say it if it was shit as well. So you just be honest about it. Um, and we basically went through the whole process together. Um, wait a minute. So how the prestigious actually works is that you can imagine that you've lost your arm until halfway. Um, if you do this, there's a muscle here that flexes. And if you do this, there's a strong muscle here. So these are the two signals that people use to uh, open a prosthesis hand and to close a prosthesis hand. And you can flex them together to get the hand in different positions that you, instead of doing this, for example, uh, you just do a mouse click or you, they have a number of, of settings where they can set the hand in and then open and close it. Um, we are talking about interaction just before. Everybody knows where how interaction between two people will happen. Everybody also knows how interaction with between you and a product will happen, computer, anything. The interesting thing I think is when it, when you interact with a person or a product through another product. This is of course where the prestige is. Um, is but it's also when you think about using a phone or Skype uh, that people you might talk different to people through Skype because there's this thing. Between. So that's the, inter that's the interesting area for this prestigious project. How does that change your perception and your engagement with the world around you? Because as it is now, still, um, you have the person who wants to grab an object, uh, so you send your actions to your prestigious hand to close the hand, where you have to look. If you're taking a plastic cup, you have to look because you're not crushing the cup. You, you might listen to the motors in the hand moving, um, but you don't really experience the object and that's what we try to do in this project where you can actually experience the object you're trying to interact with um, through the prosthesis instead of in a little loop around it. Um, of course I'm not the only one who wanted to do this, there are big companies working on it, um, there's millions of funding in it um, and they're actually really far in it. This is a, a nice visualization of one of the projects. It's called uh, Target Muscle Reinnovation. What if for people who lost their complete arm, they take the nerves that went to the fingers and they attach it to your chest muscle. And the nerves, I mean, the human body is an amazing system, and the nerves attach to your chest muscle. And if you touch your chest muscle, you feel exactly the same sensations as you felt in the part of your hand. You can also close, well, try to control your, your lost hand in the same way and you see the muscles in your chest flex so you can register that and control your prosthesis with it um, get feedback on these same positions and maybe at some point in, in the evolution of persons people you can actually feel the same sensations again but um, I definitely know that the job and probably most of the people would never want to undergo surgery or, or this whole procedure to maybe get the human sensation that they had again. Because the first thing, of course, if you well, if you have a terrible accident like that, um, is you learn to, to, to live with it. It's still your body and you still want to be able to take care of yourself. You don't want to depend on a, on a technolo technological system to do this or you don't. So it's also when I ask John sometimes if I could have his prestige for a few days to do some tests for the project. I said, yeah, sure, I'll go ahead, I'll be okay without it. So they don't want, plenty of people wouldn't want to do this. Uh, we try to do it on a lot more low level uh, where you're not going into somebody's body or having to go to search, where it's just another layer on the sense that they already have and the way of, of living that they already um, have. So they are doing it, but in a different way. Um, so we want to experience the world, or we want to en enable to experience the world around them through this prosthesis. If you think about your own senses, what is the sense of touch actually? It's very hard to describe. If you're touching the chair in front of you, it's hard to put it in words how it actually feels. You know it because you've touched it hundreds, thousands of times before. And you know it because you can explore objects. If you're blindfolded, you're not grabbing something and then that's it. You want to explore it. So that's 
but we also that, that's the way of um, feedback we eventually want to give. We can actually learn these new sensations and, and learn what it, what different things, how they feel, what you experience with it. Um, so this was the basic um, setup of the design. Um, you have the socket and you have the, the prosthesis hand, the prosthetic hand. We didn't work on the hand, by the way. These are, I think, the cheapest ones nowadays, cost twenty thousand dollars or euros. Um, so we just took one of those and we made a glove to fit around it. And in this glove, we made sensors to, well, to sense the world around you. And in the socket, um, spread out all over the limb, we just put as many vibration modes as we could. Um, if you can sense a lot and you could feedback a lot, then you can start looking for yeah, what's actually what, what people will recognize, what's, what's good to use, or start going from there. Um, so I have a little photo show um, which shows this, this process. So we start, this is the prestigious hand already, but we just yeah, tape some basic sensors on it, see what the readings were, developed our own sensors to go into the, the glove because they had to. Fit, you have to fit perfectly in this glove. So pretty small. Um, we got great help from a, 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 um, it's Liver Orthopedy, which is a big company throughout the Netherlands who make the sockets for, for amputees. Um, and they offered help in getting the sensors in the glove and later on also getting the, the vibration motors in the socket because it's quite expensive to get these things. You can't get them on the market because it's be custom made. And they were a great help in, in doing that. Um, so this was the result for the hand. Nicely integrated sensor in it. Um, this is how we started with the where the vibration motors could go. Just to spread around, spread them around enough. For John, it was also the case that the front part of his arm just had less sensations in it, so we well we focused more on the on the lower side of his arm. You see a very tiny sticker there. That's where the sensors go to uh, open and close the hand. Let the work around this. Um, some very simple testing, just if you could feel a vibration at all. Um, back to Livet again, what it helped developing the socket, all the vibration motors uh, that go in, and this is the inside of the socket. I can see that all the vibration motors are in their own free area to be able to touch the skin. Um, and the final, well, the final result for it. Um, but actually the interesting part just started then. It was really cool to have this thing to test with, but we still didn't know what we actually wanted to get into it. Because, I mean, I'm the designer, but I can't experience it. And I can think of it. if you give these vibrations with this, well, with, with, with these actions, then we still have to explore it and change it. So these were the main parameters we focused on, opening and closing your fingers. If you were touching something, the amount of fingers that you were touching, something with and the variable and, and how strong your grip is. These were the things that we started working from. Um, and these are some, well, all of the things that we tested with. So we started off with um, basically having a whole body of vibration with, if you would close your fingers, the whole, um, the whole, vib the whole part of which was vibrating was moving. And if you would touch with more fingers, it would grow, so there would be more motors. And if you would touch it more firmly, then the intensity will increase. So all the variables were combined in one body of vibration, hopefully to get a, like a moving thing around your arm that you can feel where it's going, that you can relate that to. I didn't work at all because it was just confusing for him because motors were jumping on and off and he couldn't, he couldn't even get to the point of starting to learn it. So through some steps we, 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 we went, basically, we basically went down to having one finger being directly connected to one motor on the arm, so every finger had this dedicated motor. Um, but that again led to, led to the, if you would grab something with um, five fingers, for example, and then one finger would, would maybe slip off, or you couldn't feel the difference because there were already four motors vibrating, but you couldn't feel the one shutting down again. Or you couldn't. So combining everything didn't work, and separating everything didn't work, so we had to find a way in between. Um, and I think what we ended up with was that the amount of fingers moving um, triggered the motor in a position on the arm. So if you would, if you would just press the table, press the mouse button, it would be maybe a motor here. And if you would have a, a bigger object, if you were on all fingers, 
you'll move across your arm, so you have sort of gradient on how many fingers. Um, still, the intensity of the grip was coupled to the intensity of the vibration, and for opening and closing of the hand, we put sensations right next to the parts uh, where your muscles are when you are flexing it, so that the, well, the feedback was directly, well, as direct as we could get it, related to the area where you're actually focusing your actions on. Um, might not be that clear in my story, so there's this last little video which we made at the end of the project where John also explains it. Um, and hopefully... My name is John. Two and a half years ago, I had my arm amputated. I'm using a prosthesis in which every finger can move independently. The only problem is that I can't feel anything. My name is Jeroen Blom, I'm a student at the TU Eindhoven. We started this project to develop a new tactile sense for multi-digit prosthesis. The idea was to develop a new layer of feedback through vibration patterns on the arm. We want to create variables which reflect certain characteristics of the interaction, like are the fingers moving, are you touching something, how many fingers are grabbing an object, how strong is the grip and how stable is the grip. These combined variables will activate motors individually or as a combined body of vibration and eventually it will create a pattern in the vibrations which can be recognized by John. With certain vibrations, I can feel the opening and closing of my hand. When I close my hand, I feel the vibration on the inside, and when I open my hand, I feel it on the outside. So when I grab this cup, I can feel my hand closing, and by the intense vibration on the upper part, I can feel that I'm using four fingers. I can also grab the cup with two fingers, which creates a different vibration. When I grab this object, I immediately feel I have contact with all four fingers, but the vibration is less intense, so I feel I can tighten the grip. The shape is almost equal, so you immediately feel you have contact with three fingers in this case, but you can feel that you cannot squeeze it because the vibration is stronger. This sensation also enables me to feel the difference between a hard object or a soft object. The important thing for me to know when I'm using the hand is an indication when I'm touching something and to know that I still have a secure grip. Also, when I'm holding an object for a longer period of time, the vibration fades out and warns me again that the grip changes. Um, I think the last part what he mentioned was a really interesting thing also for me because what he got from it, this example of using the, the, um, a pot when he was cooking, what he got from using this prosthesis was that he knew if he would grab the, the, the pan of the pot with his prosthesis hand and was then stirring it with the other one, he could actually feel if the grip was, if it was moving in his arm or if he you know, might fall off at some point. Or... We also, um, the, way, the reason he said it was also that because we faded out any sensations that there was when the grip became more stable, so if we would have the same sensations for, I don't know, 10 seconds I think it was, um, after that we let it fade out until nothing, so feeling nothing when you knew you were having something just meant that it was okay, because you don't need this constant, yeah, this constant vibration. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was just by exploring it together with him, knowing that you can measure a lot of things, you can feedback a lot of things, seeing what makes sense, seeing what he can recognize, uh, what he wants to recognize as well, and, and building a system from there. Um. Okay.